Through these doors have come more than 75,000 children, sick, crippled, having but little left of the good things of life. They have not asked for much, these children, to run, perhaps, to jump and shout, to laugh and play, really not much at all, only to be like other children. They have come to the James Whitcomb Riley Hospital for Children. 40,000 persons gave generously that the children of Indiana might have a place of healing and a haven of hope. 25 years ago, the hospital opened its doors. The first patient was received, a boy with curvature of the spine. But how did this all come about? Let's hear the story from one who knew James Whitcomb Riley well. Let's hear it from his personal physician, Dr. Carlton B. McCullough. Yes, I knew Jim Riley well for a great many years. I was his friend and physician. As you know, he was born in 1849 in a tiny house located on a side street in Greenfield, Indiana. And his original home is preserved there. Today, in front of the courthouse there is a statue honoring his memory. I first met Riley when he moved to Indianapolis, built in the red brick home on Lockerbie Street. This building, by the way, is now a memorial to the famous poet and has been preserved as it was when Riley lived there. To visit here always brings back many different memories. This library, where in later years he spent so many happy hours resting and reading in his big easy chair, was so much a part of him that it seemed almost as if he was still here. Many cronies visited with him here, men like George A., Booth Parkinson, and Meredith Nicholson, as shown in this old photograph. Jim's homely wit brought out frequent laughter. Once I was having dinner with him in the big old-fashioned pantry. He called as he was about to carve the milk and inquired if I had ever noticed how the shelves, such grace, match, dining room, wallpaper. At the desk between the bed and bookcase, the poet composed the lines of many of his most widely read compositions. Often he worked far into the night. I was present when recording the music, and Riley's own voice reciting some of his best loved poems. Not commensurate with modern standards, perhaps, but truly collected items. Wasn't it pleasant, old brother and I, in those old days of the last sunshine with you, when the Saturday stores were through, and the Sunday wood in the kitchen too, and we went visiting me and you, out to old Andrew. And in front of the substitute, dip barrel up in the street like these, when they were always on her knees. I feel and know for my brother so far away. This is to tell you, he waits the day to welcome us. Aunt Mary fell asleep this morning, whispering tell the bell to come. And all is well, I feel and know. Well, Riley died in 1916 and is buried in beautiful Crown Hill Cemetery in the Indianapolis. Shortly after his death, a few of his friends met at the home of Josiah K. Lilly to take measures to ensure his enduring place in the roster of outstanding men of letters. How would we do this? A huge ark? Cemetery? Well, 
no. Somehow these didn't fit the memory of Ryan, just right. It was then that Dr. Lafayette Page made the suggestion that caught the imagination of all. Why not, the doctor asked, a hospital for children? Why not indeed? Riley loved children. This would be the perfect thing for him. And so it was that we, friends of Riley, set our course. Before the James Whitcomb Riley Association, through this group, the people of Indiana poured out their sympathy and their money. The James Whitcomb Riley Hospital for Children came into being. Shortly after Dr. McCullough set for this film, they carried him to his last resting place, close to where his old friend Jim Riley lies today. But these creators of the hospital children lived to see their dreams come to life. They saw them in wards like this, a doctor making his rounds. Here, where the whole science of medicine and hospital care comes to trial, at the bedside of every afflicted child. Here, then, is the fruit born of the gift of 40,000 sympathetic hearts, a report from the Riley Memorial Association on how it guarded the trust of many people. In a huge cabinet that stands just inside the hospital entrance, the names of these 40,000 are carefully recorded and indexed. Here, their names shall remain forever, their generosity never forgotten. Trust set up in memory of some cherished one, bequests by will, pledges to be met over long periods of time, they all have played a great role in the growth of this institution. And it is gifts such as these which may provide a bulwark against future problems. But how do these children come to Riley's 300 beds or to its many clinics? Well, usually it begins in the office of a family doctor. He knows there is a place in Indiana where a child may receive medical care excelled perhaps by no place in the world. This is Riley Hospital at the Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis. The family doctor sees before him a child in need of care more highly specialized and can be provided at home. A call to the medical director of the IU Medical Center starts what may be a happier, fuller life for this child. First of all come the children of the indigent. Then, if space permits, the children of those who can pay all or part of what their treatment might cost. Soon after that family doctor calls, the wheels of a big hospital begin to turn for that sick boy or girl. The director of nurses is notified that a new patient is coming in. Surely no hospital is greater than its nursing staff. Surely none has a staff more faithful and devoted than Riley's. Now the treatment of the ill begins. Many a person owes his life today to the care he received during his first days in a bassinet at Riley. Here, new life hangs delicately on the balance of medical and nursing skills. Every effort, every attention is needed, and it is given. An oxygen tent may help sustain some child until he can breathe like other children. For limbs that are weak and may be twisted, there are expert workmen at Riley who make braces to fit the individual need of the child. This support becomes the property, then, of the child for whom it was made. In time, it may help her walk. If fortune is kind, perhaps she can take it off someday and never put it on again. Walking, climbing steps, these are difficult tasks for some children. To teach them, well, you must have abiding patience and a heart strong enough to hold back the tears, at least until the day's work is done.
Even getting up out of an overstuffed chair is something which some children have to learn, and the lesson is long and seldom easy. As a last resort, surgery. Sometimes the skilled hand of a surgeon may provide what nature has failed to. Here are performed some of the great feats of modern medicine. Or perhaps a foreign object is lodged in the lung. With this wonderful machine, the surgeon may see into the body's interior as you see into a house by looking through a window. It's called a biplane fluoroscope, the gift of the Indiana Congress of Parents and Teachers. This modern equipment enables the doctor to get hold of that foreign object in the lung and then to draw it slowly out. You'd be surprised what a child can swallow. Carpenter's staples, open safety pins, closed safety pins, screws, nails, why even political campaign buttons. Both parties, you understand. If there is a disturbance in the brain, then Riley's physicians may resort to the electroencephalograph. Through these wires, fixed to the head of the patient, the faint rhythmic waves of energy that come from the brain may be recorded and studied. Perhaps the diagnosis may be epilepsy, perhaps a tumor of the brain. These charts tell a doctor many things. Of all the children who are brought to Riley, however, few offer problems so difficult and so resistant to attention as those suffering cerebral palsy. These are children with broken connections in their nervous system. They have great difficulty doing what their minds tell them to. And science can offer very little today, if anything, to correct what is wrong. The problem in this clinic, then, is to train the child to use in the best way possible what little he has. It may sound easy saying it like that, but you would have to be a therapist or the parent of such a child to know how tedious, how slow, how heartbreaking this work can be. Here, above all other places in the hospital, the cooperation of the parent is needed, for it is mother or dad or both who really must do most of the training of these children. Fathers come to get the dimensions of special circular tables which help a child learn how to stand. Buttoning a button. For some children, this is a task as difficult almost as lifting a house would be for you. And blowing bubbles. Can you imagine a child who must be taught how to blow? Even sticking out the tongue is difficult for some. Here, a little girl is being taught to stick hers out just as a jack-in-the-box jumps out of his box. In time, these exercises may help this girl to speak. Then, of course, there is feeding time at Riley Hospital, just as there is at home. Babies must have special formulas, and they must be made under the most sterile conditions. Feeding is just as important with the sick child, more so many times, as with the healthy one. Look good. 75 gallons of ice cream are made every day at the Indiana University Medical Center. Much of it goes to the children at Riley Hospital. If the child is able, he can depend on it, he'll have ice cream with his lunch every day. No one knows better than those who work with the patients at Riley that happiness helps pave the way to health. And so for those who read, there are books, many of them. And if the patient must stay in bed and on his back, then there are projectors that throw the image of a page on the ceiling, or reading stands rigged with strings to hold back the pages. If a boy has a hobby, he's encouraged to keep it up.
and Troy is, of course, the women of the Riley Cheer Guild. See to this. A toy can help a doctor a lot sometimes. The objective, then, is to make a child stay at Riley Hospital as much like normal living as possible. And so there is school, too. Indiana University, her great staff of doctors and nurses, 
and the Riley Memorial Association have guarded the trust of more than 40,000 generous Hoosiers who built this Riley Hospital. There is no child in Indiana who need not have the best in hospital care and treatment, regardless of how lowly the position of his family. This would not have been possible without the cooperation of the Indiana University School of Medicine, which staffs the hospital. Riley, however, is not only for those of meager circumstances, for it is now possible to accept those whose parents can pay all or a part of the actual cost of operation. Riley is for every child who needs it. But now this institution faces a great new challenge. What of the child with rheumatic fevers, the diseases caused by an unseen virus, the hearts that are never perfectly formed, the bodies that grow too little or too much? Great as its knowledge may be, there are so many things that medical science needs to know. We have done much, but there is still twice, three times, who knows how much more to be done. In the centennial year of the birth of James Whitcomb Riley, the Memorial Association bearing his name proposes to launch a full-fledged investigation into the diseases of children. Here in this new wing, sketched by an architect and now being built by the state of Indiana, it is proposed to expand to far greater proportions a program of a vigorous investigation supported by the Riley Centennial Research Fund. And so once again, for the first time since 1926, the Riley Memorial Association goes to the people of Indiana with this challenge. Shall we help science throw its searching beam of light into the pathetic areas of medical darkness? Here in these test tubes, these culture dishes, on these microscopic slides, lie the hopes of tomorrow's children. You see here an investigation of rheumatic fevers, one of the greatest enemies of children here in our own state. The particular problem at hand is the grouping and typing of a bacterial organism called hemolytic streptococcus. Doctors don't know whether this organism causes rheumatic fever or not. But there is considerable evidence that it is at least associated with the disease. But there are many types of hemolytic streptococcus. What kind is it that possibly damages the heart of a child? It is studies such as this one that may someday provide an answer. It could develop this way. What if it were determined that a child's body fought back in a specific way against a particular type of streptococcus? Then, what if it were found that a child's body has less ability than an adult to fight back against this germ? Science might then be on the brink of a great new boon to child health. In the blue cloud in the middle of this tube, you see a positive result in a test group for a group A hemolytic streptococcus. Is this the criminal in rheumatic fever? This is but one of the questions which might be answered through supporting grants from the Riley Centennial Research Fund. It is the type of challenge that whets the imagination of men in all walks of life. Men like the Honorable Henry F. Stricker, Governor of the State of Indiana. You and I have known Riley Hospital for 25 years as a place where our underprivileged children should have unexcelled medical care. In this picture, you have seen only a little of the equipment, only a few of the children at Riley. We have the best, thanks to the generous men and women of our state. But this is not enough. There are unsolved mysteries in cancer. There are mysteries in polio. There are mysteries in the ailment of the heart, which the greatest physician has not penetrated. There are these and many other problems. Riley Hospital thus faces a new challenge. There is no thought, of course, of relaxing its day-by-day -day service to the afflicted, but it now proposes to rededicate itself to the continuous search for still unknown life-saving food. In the support of this sacred service, all men and women of goodwill are invited to join. 